Welcome to this next lecture on RDF of the Knowledge and Data course um, uh, in the second module. This lecture is going to be about RDF semantics and it's uh, probably the most advanced of all the lectures of this module at least. Um, I want to make the link to the notion of entailment that we've done before with the knowledge graphs but there are some details that we simply won't worry too much because this, this is more advanced material that you would probably face in later courses or in the master. But what I still want to convey is that uh, remember that when you assign value to a triple, then basically what you have to do is that you assign value to each of the elements of the triple, so to the subject, to the object and the predicates. So remember what kind of thing we could um, have in the different positions. We could have literals, we could have your eyes, and we could have variables. So let's not worry about the variables at the moment, but let's worry about these two different types, literals and your eyes. And again, one more thing, complicating things, is that the your eyes could be either objects and resources we want to talk about, or they could be properties. This is, this is very ugly in a formal way, but it's very useful in practice. So the way you would have your interpretations in RDF semantics is that you allow your eyes to be either a property and then you need a specific interpretation for your property, namely that it's a pair of objects, or it's a resource and then you would need an interpretation that is just an object. And also the literals we just interpret as a set of objects but with some specific untyped information so we have a, a, an additional number of letters and things of which we don't really know what it is but they are literal so things to describe um, information without them being necessarily objects so basically for each element of the subject position which could be your eyes or blank notes it's not so difficult we have only one choice of interpreting uh, these this your eyes side here and then we could, we, they could be either properties, so we tell something about a property, or they could be resource. If we are interpreting an object in the object position, then we have the choice of this being either a literal or a URI or even a blank node. So this makes a very complicated picture of how we could interpret a triple. That's why in our very simple logic before, we interpreted everything in the subject position as an object in the domain and we only allowed for properties in the property uh, position um, to simplify matters. But what is very important to see is that in our language that we defined last week, the simple knowledge graph logic, we couldn't say anything about the properties. We couldn't say this property is transitive or it's semantic or it has a uh, a domain or it has a range whereas in RDF we can do this so this makes the definition of what an interpretation and thus a model very complicated but this is not a matter of this course the only thing you should remember is that we still assign interpretations to each of the statements if each of the triples and we then get a set of models, namely the valid interpretations for a knowledge graph. And based on this notion of model, we can define a notion of entailment. And this is exactly what we see now. So um, uh, the, the graph simply entails a graph if every interpretation that is a model for the first graph is also a model of the second. So the only thing we need to do now is to uh, define what a model means, and we use this complicated notion of interpretation that I showed you on the slide before, and we have also to take care of uh, the blank notes. Um, um, and basically how you do this is by rewriting blank notes into your eyes um, so that they basically have the same meaning like the grounded graphs. And then you get a definition, a formal definition that um, if there is a way of rewriting the var variables so that the graph becomes a, uh, an interpretation becomes a model for this grounded graph, uh, which is basically that it becomes a subset of this graph. So the only thing that really matters for you is that basically a graph 
and tells another graph if and only if this other graph can be obtained from G by replacing some nodes in G by blank nodes. And then we take any subject subset of this G star is then entailed. So the, the first thing you can do is rewrite your graph by taking, taking any resource identifier name for the variable, for the blank node, and then you, um, you look for subset as we did in the previous uh, one, in the previous assignment. So the former semantics mean that we can derive everything that is entailed and in this sense, it's, it's everything that is in the graph with some modulo rewriting for variable. But there is more meaning in such an RDF graph. And that comes from the shared use of vocabularies. So if people want to say the same things, they very often ref use the same vocabularies. And Tim explains it very nicely in the video that we also linked to. Um, we all understand these vocabularies and they are standard in many cases. So if I write a paper, I use references, I use uh, um, ISBN, I use uh, Dublin Core to describe uh, who's the author. So there is a standardized vocabulary of uh, terminology that we use in many different applications, such as in a bag of ships, as you will see in the video from uh, Tim. This means that whoever uses this shared vocabulary understands the statements in the same way. And this is not so much a formal uh, semantics, but it's more a social semantics. By agreeing, not in, in, a, in a forced way, we, we don't force anybody to use a specific way of writing down things, but by uh, using as a convenience for me, but also for, for others, a certain vocabulary um, makes that my statements become far more interpretable. They become, they get a social meaning. And this is a very important part of this web initiative for data publishing. It comes with a price because um, there is also a social meaning attached, namely that everybody can say anything about anything. Don't forget this. So I can publish information. Um, I can just, for example, publish uh, these, these uh, triples that Inside Out is a film and it has a, a label Inside Out in English and it's a, a, some different name in German and in, 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 in Dutch, I believe. Binnest uh, about, of course, my, um, I think. Um, so this is something that could be published on DBpedia, but it's also something I could publish. On some other place, this might be published, that director, Pete Doctor, is the director of this, this film, the Saint film. And obviously this becomes very, very useful if I want to collect as much information about this film, this movie, from various sources. I can also use Rotten Tomatoes to get a, 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 ref, a, a, a review and I can get a score, whether it's a good film or not. So they are three statements from the same source, from the same resource about the same subject. And that makes it very powerful. It uses one URI, one identifier, so that it's clear that it talks about the same objects, but the information comes from, comes from different places and uh, is reusable. And this is really one of the strong points of the RDF. But I can now also say that I'm the director of this movie and I can publish it and everybody sort of can believe it or not. So the power of the web is that we can all publish things. And this is the same power on the web of data. We can publish data, but now the question is what of the data is more trustworthy, which one is more, uh, is true and so forth. And the former semantics for this would probably fail because it can't make a distinction between the semantics that in IMDb they say that Peter Doctor is the, 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 the director, and I say that I'm the director, but uh, there we need some notions of uh, uh, popularity that IMDb is more popular than my way of publishing data and so forth, which is similar to the mechanism we have on the web of documents. Let me wrap up with a final comment on semantics because um, this is also called the semantic web, so semantics really have a very important role. 
and I gave two different signals, I think, here. So we have a formal semantics, and this formal semantics is extremely important because it allows us to derive the same consequences whenever we apply these semantics to our data sets that have been specified in IDF. So there should be whatever query engine you use, if it uses Sparkle correct, then from the same data sets, you should always get the same answers. And that is not trivial, uh, surely not as trivial as it might sound. So it is rather complicated to have really agreement on what things mean. Um, in practical implementations, for example, you can get a database query language uh, or database that returns a maximum number of results. And then you already get a different result than some other database. And uh, to predict what kind of results you get is not trivial. But these semantics, these formal semantics that are rather complicated, I, I admit, but they allow us to formally exactly know what kind of results we should expect when we apply these semantics. The second thing is that uh, because we live in a world where people are involved, there is a certain expectation of when they model data that they can use vocabulary and then they can also interpret vocabularies in a way that they expect it to be. So they can derive their own consequences um, and the more shared vocabularies are used, the more the better, because then there is an, a common agreement on, on facts, which is not as strong as this, this uh, uh, predictable inference where we can be certain that we get the same results, but it allows us to, do it, to give at least similar results. And this is the power of this, uh, this, uh, this web initiative, that it has both the formal side uh, on which the tools are built, but also a social side as a, as a part of the Web 2.0 initiative.